Okay, so this is just generally now overviewing how your body responds first to cold and then we'll go over the response to heat. So normally thermal equilibrium is achieved primarily through vasomotor regulation. So fine-tuning the sympathetic nervous system and cutaneous blood flow. In response to cold, the thermoregulatory system initiates responses to conserve heat and if necessary augment heat production. So the first thing it's going to do is the heat conserving mechanism and the peripheral vasoconstriction occurs, your AV shuts close and blood is kept away from the surface. So that thermal conductivity of your shell is reduced, heat loss is lowered and the countercurrent exchange starts activating and so you don't lose so much heat from the core and you're conserving your, your, your heat. The heat loss is lowered and sweating is inhibited but this insensible evaporation still occurs. And if that's not enough then you're going to increase your heat production by shivering or voluntary activity and this will then increase your metabolic rate and warming up the core. And so these two things together, this shivering, this creating energy and the withdrawal of the cutaneous circulation and the blood flow in these venous comatans, this is how your body conserves heat and maintains the heat of the core. <clears throat> and when you go into a warm environment, not surprisingly, or the excessive heat production is you're exercising, the opposite occurs. So peripheral vasodilation, the AV shunts open, the thermal conductivity of the shell is raised and you can start letting off a, a large amount of heat. The heat transfer of the core to surface is augmented due to greatly increased peripheral blood flow again. This increases the convective current, it increases the thermal conductivity of the shell and heat flows much faster through it. And also you have increased evaporative heat loss, you start to sweat and then now you pick up the amount of evaporation and particularly if you're moving that evaporation is going to increase and so um, you start to lose heat. Now remember if the atmosphere is warmer than your skin the only way you're going to lose heat is by sweating and <clears throat> it removes heat from the body but also cools the skin so that the skin is uh, less than the core and therefore heat can start to leave. Obviously you have to remember that heat travels downhill and so if you can make your skin colder than your core then heat will start to leave your core and this is why sweating and evaporation is good for lowering your core temperature and stop you overheating. Okay so the neural mechanisms of temperature control are shown here. <clears throat> Thermoreceptors are located in the hypothalamus, the skin and elsewhere. The hypothalamus and neighbouring preoptic area of the brain establish a set point. You have a, a, a physiological set point that your body tries to maintain the core temperature at. And we'll talk a bit about that in the next couple of slides. Transmission of the error signals to the appropriate effector mechanism Controlling shivering, sweating and vasomotor action will then allow you to respond to whatever challenge it is. So if we come over here, we have uh, the core temperature and the, the skin temperature. And these are sensed by skin thermoreceptors or core thermoreceptors. And the body will sense an error signal, maybe you're too hot in the core and then uh, your cerebral cortex will lower your voluntary responses, uh, it will send um, <clears throat> signals to the hypothalamus and reduce your thyroid uh, releasing hormone, your TSH releasing hormone and to the pituitary uh, TSH is lowered, your thyroid hormone is lowered, your metabolic rate reduces and uh, you, you lower your core metabolic rate and then obviously in the skin 
you start to have the AV shunts happening, you start to lose heat. And then in the opposite direction, maybe your skin is cold and your core starts to drop, the opposite will happen. TRH will be released, TSH will be released, thyroid hormone will increase, your metabolic rate will, um, <clears throat> will increase in order to raise your body temperature, sweat glands will close, your adrenal medulla will release epinephrine so that your metabolic rate will increase and raise the temperature of your core, your voluntary muscles, your voluntary responses will increase. And so in response to the cold environment, this is how your body then will activate things. And it's in two directions. When you're cold, things, things will increase, apart from your sweat, obviously, which will reduce. And then when you're warm, your metabolic rate will fall and your sweat glands will open. Uh, and through these mechanisms, through this mechanism of temperature control, you keep yourself as close as possible to that 37 degrees. Now, the hypothalamic set point. Mentioned it there, it's a very real thing. It's more than just an abstraction, it clearly is an internal reference for a preference of a certain set point, and it can change, and it does change. Um, <clears throat> so in monkeys, they've tested high serum sodium at the hypothalamus, and this increases the set point. So the monkeys start to feel cold and their uh, core heats up, they start you know, having a greater metabolic energy. And then low serum, uh, serum sodium does the opposite. It lowers the set point so they feel more comfortable at a colder temperature. High serum calcium at the hypothalamus decreases the set point. Kind of the opposite of what, of what sodium does. And then pyrogens increase the set point. And we'll talk about pyrogens when it comes to fever, which is the last part of this lecture. Dehydration increases the set point. So when you're dehydrated, you feel cold because your set point is now raised. No longer is at 37, it'll be 38 or 39. And you start shivering, even though the room might be reasonably um, warm. And then various neurological disorders and injuries can also modify the set point. Exercise also might increase the set point too. So thermoreceptors, you have two and uh, fairly self-explanatory, not uh, anything too complicated. You have warm fibers and as the temperature raises they fire faster and then you have cold fibers and as it gets colder, they fire faster. And so you, you tell then whether it's warm or hot by these thermoreceptors. And they're naked nerve endings whose fire rate changes based on the temperature. And I just talked about that. Warm fibers fire faster at hot temperatures. Cold, fires, cold fibers fire more at colder temperatures. Skin thermoreceptors are distributed non-uniformly over the entire body surface. And then your core internal thermoreceptors are located in the hypothalamus, the spinal cord, and the respiratory tract, the viscera, and the tongue. And so they're fairly well dispersed so that your body has good readings from all kinds of areas. Sweating and shivering. Sweating is controlled by information from internal and skin thermoreceptors. Mainly, sweating begins when the core temperature rises above about 37 degrees. And then <clears throat> the sweat glands will open and you'll start to sweat. Lower values of skin, I below about 32 progressive, inhibit the, the sweat production. So if your skin is cold but your body's hot, uh, they'll still shut. The, the, the sweat glands off. And shivering occurs when your core temperature drops to below 37 degrees. So this is just basically when sweating and shivering is activated. For core temperature greater than about 37 degrees, no shivering occurs until skin temperature is reduced below about 20 degrees. So there's a balance between your core temperature and your skin temperature and the core is most important. But if your skin does drop too much, you'll start shivering anyway. 